But I mean, there's an adage that, that I've followed through through my career is that you can have great technology and a terrible team or a great team and a terrible technology and the great team will succeed every time. Welcome to Startup Bill, the show where we discuss what it's like to build a tech startup and a startup ecosystem in a small city. I'm Mike Wolsfeld, our host is Dan Gold, and welcome to this special episode where we're celebrating Global Biotech Week. Global Biotech Week started 18 years ago right here in Canada and has since gone global, raising awareness for the significant role biotech plays in the world today. So to celebrate Global Biotech Week, we've interviewed three leaders in the biotech sector to learn more about what they do, and what makes biotech different from the typical startup experience. First in today's episode, we talked with Jay Robinson of AgWest Bio and the Gap Accelerator, or Global Agri-Food Advancement Partnership. We talked with Jay about the Gap Accelerator, a new organization created to support early stage and rapid growth companies in all areas of agriculture and food. Welcome to Startup Bill. This episode is brought to you by Martin Charlton Communications, AgWest Bio, Biotalent Canada, and Innovation Place. Jay, welcome to Startupville. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So what can you tell me, just as a background, about the Global Agri-Food Advancement Partnership? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, the Global Agri-Food Advancement Partnership, or GAP, uh, with two A's, is, is, a, is a new initiative, and it's um, something we're really excited about. So it's, it's kind of come together um, through, it, it's, a, it's a, a joint venture, if you will, a brand new entity that's a fund as well as a hybrid incubator. And um, it's, it's been made up of both public and private, you know, uh, aligned partners. And we all share this vision of really how to move innovation within the ag and food sector through to uh, commercialization as well as adoption in the field. So some of those partners are, you know, AgWest Bio, the Global Institute of Food Security, Innovation Place, um, a, a number of private industry partners that, that we can't divulge right now, uh, and that's what's what's really funding our efforts moving forward. So we're, we're really excited about kind of what we're setting out to do and and what makes us different, uh, not just locally but globally. I'm not one to lean in on acronym because they just leave, lead to confusion to so many people. But when we look at the KPIs of your organization, bringing it together, what of those goals, what, what are they big picture and how are you going to measure the success of the project? Yeah, I think uh, they're a great question. So I think the biggest thing that, that we set out to do was when we look at the ag and, and agri-food space in, in globally, but, but specifically in Canada and, and Western Canada, you know, I think... Um, you know, the Canadian Venture Capital Association in 2020 had announced that I think roughly uh, 4.4 billion was invested in Canada from, from VC capital. Um, over roughly 87, 90% of that was was in the state, in the provinces of, of Ontario, Quebec, and, and BC. And well over half of that went to, uh, you know, IT and software not related to ad. So when we look at the, the opportunities in the world and where Canada, you know, we and our partners believe Canada has a place to play, um, you know, Western Canada, Canada as a whole, uh, certainly in the ag and agri-food space, what we saw is there's a big void in capital uh, in, in the space and we feel we can do that. But I think what, what makes Gap truly unique and what's pulling us together is there's so much more than capital. Uh, there's money available. Um, but it's not just about money. It's, it's about what else we can do with ourselves and, and the domain partner experts that we have. We have this, this deep knowledge and, and firsthand experience built from either serial entrepreneurs, executives in multinational agri-food companies, uh, farms all the way across the, the platform, right, from farm to fork. And having that knowledge and expertise in addition to the facilities, which we talk about, and, and kind of the approach we're having, is really what makes this different in the space. And, and, you know, so we're able to leverage the capital and um, with this domain expertise and and really we talk about the metrics, it it goes beyond financial for us. So yes, there's obviously as a fund, we're talking about the financial returns, uh, but it's also about bringing that that innovation to the farm gate and ultimately making Canadian farmers that much more competitive on the global scale. So So it's 
really standing out as a difference maker by firstly focusing on here uh, but secondly not getting caught down the the rabbit hole of going into it and software and and really focusing on the end deliverables yeah I, 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 the big thing for us is we're playing to our strengths so for if you look at our partners in the space um and and some of the private industry software has become a, a real big area in ag um, you know, at least these software apps and platforms. We're kind of steering away from that. We have the fundamental belief that the digital and computational integration into all areas of agriculture in the next 10 years will be everywhere, right? 10 years or more. So we're not, we're not shying away from that, but we're, we're focusing more on the hard things that you can touch and fill. So whether that be uh, new crop protection products, whether that be different types of plant proteins, alternative feed, um, animal health and nutrition. That's really where we're leaning in genetics, uh, robotics, those kind of things. Um, so software is integrated into all those areas now. Um, but the end result isn't an app that you have on your phone or, or something. And there's certainly a place for that, but where at, where gap is focused is, is on these other areas where the end result is something that you drive, you sit on, you plant in your field, in the, the actual things that you can touch and feel and play with. Um, from that perspective. Tangibles. I, I'm liking this because there's there's a lot of investment in, in um, apps and technologies which are going to be competing whilst they're evolving in different spaces and coming together in the marketplace, but actually investing in the people and the ideas and the, the application of the tools that may come into the, to the workplace is going to be important. How, when you're looking at accelerators you very often look at investing in the people and looking at the people and the ideas as that balance between the two maybe they're not always the strongest idea but they're really good people who just need the coaching to be able to bring a better idea to fruition and sometimes it's a really strong idea but the people need coaching into bringing them into that mindset space what are you putting into place to really support both sides of that yeah, that's a great, I mean, there's an adage that, that I've followed through through my career is that you can have great technology and a terrible team or a great team and a terrible technology and the great team will succeed every time, right? Over, over the great technology and a terrible team. Um, and that's all about training, coaching, experience. So a big part of that is, you know, going back to that digital piece, I'll answer your question in a bit of a different way. When we're, when we're not just investing in software and we're investing in the tangible hardware things, the path and the timeline and, the, and the, the requirements to get that to market is a lot more capital intensive. You need specialized equipment, you know, you need greenhouses, laboratories, field trials, all those kind of things. And you can't have, you can't take multiple renditions to the marketplace of, you know, uh, a genetic plant and let the marketplace tell you how to do it because it's heavily regulated. So we've really had to tailor how we do that. And that comes back to how we train the people, but also the services we offer. So, you know, to date, most accelerators and incubators, for the most part, offer these short three month cohorts and make these small bets of $25,000. We've completely eliminated that. So we run more like a VC fund. So we offer upwards of a million dollars in, in equity investment. We offer uh, in partnership with Innovation Place and, and others, we own uh, a 12, over a 12,000 square foot facility where we can house our companies for up to four years, right? And we can offer them in that state-of-the-art laboratories and greenhouses and office space. And it coupled in with that to answer your, your, your question, now we have you know both the gap management team, we have a, a plethora of advisors across that, that platform of, of the channel, like I was talking about, whether it's industry veterans, startup entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs who have exited, as well as, you know, regulatory experts and these kind of things. And we're building uh, very specific training programs around that to and it's sector specific, right? So we're not going to have some a biofuel diesel expert advise a genetic crop protection insecticide on how to move through regulatory. And that's something really different, right? We've got people that are have first uh, hand experience deep domain experience exactly in the sector that we want. And we can pull from the app pool of people um, to really guide those companies. So what that means with our platform is now we have capital, sizable capital that we invest. 
we know that these companies take four to seven years to, to really get to the marketplace from the time we're investing and we will house them for, for a long period of time. So we're in the trenches with them. We have the firsthand knowledge. We're providing them all the facilities at, at no cost. And that means that the money we're investing uh, means that that company can do more with less because the cost of overhead business is that much lower. And they're getting to market faster because we're helping them navigate the pitfalls. Normally, there's two things that come from that. The, the entrepreneur retains more ownership of his company or her company, and the technology that's innovative gets to the farm that much quicker. And it comes to our end result of helping Canadian farmers be more competitive on the global scale. So in bringing this all together, um, it takes a lot of a lot of willingness from the different partners uh, to come on board. Uh, in terms of timelines for for programming and intakes of of entrepreneurs and, and startups, where are you on the uh, timeline? Yeah, yeah. So again, we we don't do uh, like like a, like I mentioned, we don't do cohorts. So we're not putting out things saying, you know, there's some there's some uh, exceptions to the rule, but for the most part, we're not putting out things that say, hey, apply between now and December for this cohort that runs for six months. That's not how we run. We uh, again with our team that's global and global connections and, and experience. We scour the world, look for the best teams, like you mentioned, people invest in people. Um, and the most promising technologies, and we bring them in. So we could bring in six at any one time, or we could bring in you know two. Right? It it really varies on when the opportunity is there. So that being said, you know we we've already uh, we'll be announcing right away of our first two companies that are lined up. Um, officially, our space opens uh, next month um, with the twelve thousand square feet, or, or just over. And there will obviously be a, a, a bit of a ribbon cup and press release uh, when we get to that. And, you know, we, again, as a fund, we're just identifying the best companies and bringing them in uh, as and when we need to. So it's it's not like we've got to fit into a box of, you know, we only have intakes here. And if you don't fit into that window, you've missed the boat. That's not how we operate. So. No, and that that's nice to see that then you've got the flexibility to be able to really apply your services skills and the, give the opportunities to the organizations when they're ready, which is great to see, and when there is a, is a fit. I, can I just take this back a little bit, Jay? Um, you know, this is a very small, close-knit community, and it's always nice for people to know a little bit about our guests. And, and I'm really intrigued when it comes to your history of ag tech entrepreneurship and and investment mm -hmm. yeah so no my, my background so I, i've started and, and exited three ag tech companies now um you know the first one was uh, obviously you can tell from my accent i'm, I'm not canadian it's the first one we had we had which we sold in 2008 which is on food preservation so we had a way where we'd incorporate uh, different types of uh organic compounds into packaging. So as the humidity would increase in the packaging, it released these compounds and, and uh, preserve, uh, predominantly it was lettuce and spinach and berries and strawberries, blueberries. And then uh, when we moved to Canada, started another company, um, we built a facility and, and had a manufacturing facility here in Saskatoon. Um, you went through all the things of raising all the money. I mean, we had 253 shareholders at one point. Um, you know, I have to credit the team that, that uh, a lot of the surrounding people around me uh, that ended up being traded on the Canadian uh, Stock Exchange market caps, roughly 140 million. Um, so that, that did very well. Um, since then, I then invested in uh, another company and, and took on a board position as well as uh, acted as the, the global director of corporate strategy. And we sold that company uh, to the second largest private company in the US about two years ago. And also in between that time, I worked for one of the largest privately held agri-food companies doing mergers and acquisitions. Uh, so we were uh, you know, predominantly South America, but pretty much everywhere looking at companies that we could acquire and bring in. So a big part of that was working with uh, both that company, but also other large Fortune 500 companies to look at how you can embrace uh, external innovation to support your own internal goals. Uh, and that acquisition is just one, one way of doing that. So. 
So one of the things we often talk about here on Startupville is the attraction of talent to Saskatchewan and why people make the move either across Canada or from the States or from other parts of the world when there are, you know, there are opportunities in other places. What is the mm -hmm. magnet of Saskatchewan? Yeah, no, that's great, and, and it is it is a catch. I think one of the us, you know one of the, the challenges Saskatchewan has uh, coming from the outside, right? Most McCreary's is we sometimes think too small, right? So uh, you know the ad the adage I use is you know there's there's companies that are making snack food, right, at the Saskatchewan Food Center or you know the Agri Food Innovation Center, which is one of our partners. And a win for them is they get into the local federated co op stores or Sobeys locally. And that's where they hang their hat, and that's a that's a major uh, a milestone, and, and you need they need to be applauded for that. But don't stop there; grow bigger, right? And that that goes beyond the entrepreneurs. That's also you know the local organizations. So sometimes we uh, we forget that we're competing globally. So you know we're too busy fighting you know with uh, you know quarreling with other provinces versus them coming together as a whole and playing to our strengths because we're, we, you know, we're competing with the US, Israel, Germany, the UK. So to answer your question, what makes uh, Canada very strong is obviously first off, it's, it's, it's closest to one of the biggest markets in the world is, is the US, right? Um, but what you've seen in the last five years is there's companies even from the US moving up to Canada and there's a number of reasons for that. One is, is the, uh, innovation support that we have around here. Things as simple as having um, SRED tax credits of 35%. They don't have that elsewhere. Programs like a NRC IRAP, you know, SDT, Sustainable Development Technologies Canada, all these other things. Um, and then you top onto that things like MyTax. So you can hire recent graduates and have support for that. So that that is already coming back to really being able to extend your dollar from an entrepreneur's perspective you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times over. Um, but then it's the support of, of you've got the local community, which is if you think of like you're if you're doing something like canola, it's one of the biggest markets in the world. Peas, you know, a lot of those broad acre crops, you move into BC and some of those things. So it's the proximity. You can be in Saskatchewan, low cost of living, um, you know, a lot a lot of a good environment around that, like from the cultural perspective. But the proximity to some of the biggest markets in the world, a stable government, um, and, and let's not face it, uh, let's, let's not ignore it. The, if you're coming from the US, you're coming from Israel, you're coming from Europe, your dollar is very strong, right, on the Canadian dollar, and that goes a long way. Um, so I think it's all these pieces coming together. And I mean, for us, being on a, right adjacent to the, the University of Saskatchewan, your talent pool there is great. You've got direct links from Saskatoon. Um, it, it's just, and, and you mentioned about the tight-knit community. One of the things we've realized, a lot of our... Uh, limited partners are international groups and you know they you know they were saying to us that you know they didn't really comprehend until they came here that they made a comment an airport adjacent hotel to london heathrow england is would be the distance from going from here to you know 40 kilometers north of the city and everything we do is so close there's such a huge advantage to that right <laughs> Oh, and I've been on those buses way too many times, <laughs> having to leave silly early, getting all the family onto a plane, onto a coach, into the airport, onto the plane. Believe me, so much simpler here. Honestly, don't don't go somewhere huge. Um, Jay, uh, time is working against us, but thank you for giving us these insights. Uh, if pi people if people wanted to find out more information about you and the organisation, where could they go? So I think the, the first bit right now is is they can either uh, go to the AgWest Bio website um, and they see uh, that I, I also uh, work as the COO there, so they can they can get get hold of us that way, and then uh, we will be launching our, our GAP website right away. But uh, right now, go to the AgWest Bio website and, and contact us there. And we are, uh, like I said, we're always scouring for companies. We're actively investing right now, so we encourage you to reach out and uh, hit us up. Jay. Thank you so much for joining us here on Startupville. Well, I appreciate the time and, and thanks for what you guys do. I really enjoy it. So. Next up is Conrad Nixon, co-founder of Back to Your Roots, a food startup specializing in raw fermented food products, handcrafted using minimal ingredients. 
Hello and welcome to Startupville. It is delightful to be back once again. Today, I have with me Conrad Nixon from Back to Your Roots. Conrad, thank you for joining us on this episode. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So for anyone who doesn't know, give us the elevator pitch of uh, Conrad Nixon and uh, Back to Your Roots. Yeah, so I started my health journey back in uh, 2018, uh, which essentially led me to form this company. Uh, it'll be two years this October uh, with a business partner who's a chef by trade. And we essentially cater to health conscious people that appreciate uh, delicious food uh, in a convenient way. And that pretty much sums it up. We try to source as many local ingredients as we can uh, and try to make our products uh, as sustainably as possible. Um, as well. So what was the inspiration for this? I mean, it's very easy to look at this. Oh, you know, it, it's a trending topic. It's very um, on point for right now as, as, as a business idea. Yeah. But very often people that get into this space have an ethical reason why they do it. Mm, yeah, I know for sure. Yeah, for me, I think the, um, the biggest... I guess spark or kind of what inspired me is just my own progress with my own kind of journey in terms of finding my health and the benefits I saw from adopting a, um, a plant-based lifestyle and just really using that, that food to, uh, to fuel my lifestyle and really get me active. Of course I do triathlons. Um, I've done, you know, a couple of Ironmans. I do marathons. I'm doing the Queen City Marathon this Sunday. Um, so that really, when I saw the benefits of it, and then I really saw there was a niche in the market or that we could have our own niche, because a lot of the options right now is whenever you take convenience, you almost always sacrifice health. A lot of the food that's convenient is highly processed. There's a bunch of preservatives in there. There's a bunch of stabilizers, um, and they don't really have your health at their best interest, essentially. So that's really where we thought, well, maybe we could come in and essentially the foods we're already eating, could we produce those uh, for the general public where it's easy for them to prepare, we can use minimal ingredients. And we figured out that we can do that and that a lot of the ingredients we eat and consume are grown here in the beautiful province of Saskatchewan. So it's easier for, um, obviously, in terms of us getting the ingredients, it doesn't have to travel as far. Um, so yeah, we just kind of put everything together and we made a run in it about, uh, about a year and a half ago, just starting off at the Regina Farmer's Market. So there's everything there. There's reduced food mileage. There is um, being kind to the planet. There is being good to yourself. It's the trifecta of food. But let's look at the business model itself. It's great to come into something and have a vision from the day you started with your partner, uh, and firstly, maybe it's that element. Finding a partner isn't always easy, specifically when it's aligning, um, whether it's uh, belief sets or commercial goals or whatever it is. How did you come together? Yeah, so my business partner and I, we worked together uh, previously, actually. I'd been in the hospitality industry for years, um, specifically in sales. And, uh, yeah, we came together. He's cooked all over the world, so he has – like the food products I sell, they're all his recipes. He produces everything with a small team. Um, so he's kind of the brains behind the actual products. Can we produce it in a sustainable way and things like that? Where I look after more kind of the uh, sales and, and distribution side of uh, things for the, for the company. But yeah, you know, when you have a business partner, it's like almost marrying someone. Like there's some days where I just want to wind up and punch him in the back of the head when he's not looking. And then, you know, two hours later, I want to hug the guy. So it's, you know, it has its highs and its lows, but you definitely need to, like, our advantage is opposites attract, where he's very, you know, doesn't fear, you know, conflict, uh, speaks his mind, is very honest, where I'm more, um, you know, laid back, I'm a bit more conservative, I don't always like contact, um, or conflict part of me. So, so yeah, so we definitely complement each other. Uh, but of course, communication with any relationship, any business partnership is key. Um, so if things are bugging you, you need to you need to let them know. But uh, yeah, it's obviously it doesn't it's not for everyone. Uh, but in some cases, uh, it can work, and it's been working for us so far. Every chef that I know 
is deeply passionate and they believe in what they're doing and why they're doing it. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. And so to balance that with an uh, almost a yin yang is is a really successful potentially successful partnership i'm interested in you know you work on the commercial side you work on the sales side i'm interested in this uh, growth potential it, this is on trend i mean this also fits into trends such as like subscription boxes and you know meal kits obviously is, is incredibly uh, popular but but when you look at marketing, when you've got these other guys who are national or from America, and they've got these marketing budgets, which we can only dream about, where do you start? So we had two kind of two big learning experiences. So packaging is everything. When you're in the local stores, um, local health food stores, there's a smaller team there. Everyone knows who I am. They know our products. And there's not a lot of people in Saskatchewan currently doing what we're doing. So we're not, there's no one really, we're not, we don't have a lot of competitors of some of our products. But when we launched into Safeway Sobeys, A, our packaging sucked. And B, our pricing wasn't where it needed to be. And we were in the freezer with these companies that have million dollar marketing budgets. They're, they had the perfect packaging. So we, we failed. And that was a big learning lesson for us. To we need to invest and do whatever it takes to, to really up our game in terms of the packaging because you can get into all the stores you want in our business, but if no one picks up the product off the shelf, well, it's useless. The store's just going to turn it over and you're not going to get back in there kind of thing. So packaging is everything. And we've actually we've been working with a local company, uh, Bravo Tango, uh, shout out to them, who's been uh, essentially helping us with their rebrand. So they gave us a new look for our fermented products. They gave us a brand new website, a new logo. And then they're designing our freezer bags that we're going to have manufactured in Toronto just to keep it in Canada. Um, and we're going to be launching those in October, which will kind of give us a look we need. But that, yeah, it's, it comes down to packaging. You have to have the right price point, the right package so people can kind of see what you're trying to, to sell. Because especially with COVID, we can't always be in the stores um, in terms of, you know, having people sample our products or demo our products and things like that. So the packaging is everything. I I couldn't agree more. And uh, creating that advocacy and that cycle of, you know, educating one person, they try the product, they like it, they share share the recommendation with someone else. Can, it, the classic recommendation engine, word of mouth. Um, and, you know, in this day and age, the only thing that's changed is that we've digitized it with social media and and, yeah. and the such like. So you're doing this in a time when the world is, let's say, a little bit different to mm. how it is normally. Has that presented opportunities or challenges? Mm. You know, a bit of both. We found with um, when things kind of slowed down and, you know, last year and people weren't really sure what to do. Obviously, the hospitality industry was, you know, being honest, was destroyed overnight kind of thing. They, you know, they've suffered and some of them are still suffering. Is People were more open to ordering online. So, of course, when that all happened, we just launched our online store to cater to the local market in Regina. So there was that opportunity there. In terms of challenges, the biggest challenge we faced is when we were going into newer markets. Saskatoon would be a great example. And we didn't have the best packaging and we couldn't be in the store to really educate people about our products. Um, and people weren't really wanting to talk to you when they were in the stores. They just want to get their stuff, get out kind of thing. That was the biggest challenge we face is how do we establish a brand when we can't, we're not used to having the tools that we've had in the past to really market our business uh, and what we're trying to achieve and, of course, our products kind of thing. So, But compared to other businesses that were majorly affected, I mean, we were when I look at it that way, we were almost unaffected kind of thing. And, hey, any way you can see out a tough time, it means you'll have greater success when it comes to the other side when there is this opportunity for much more significant growth and that opportunity to get in front of people. Um, I'm intrigued about the product. I'm more intrigued about the people behind the product and the plan. The And again, COVID times, I know that it's a little bit different at the moment, because of how it is, but is there a is there an element of okay our one year three year five year is scale 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 sell or 
scale, 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 add more staff, grow, own the product long term, be be the, you know, grow into the company that that really pushes this nationally and beyond borders, let's say. Because yeah. In this market, particularly, you look at the acquisitions of someone like PepsiCo or other international uh, food corporations. They have been on a little bit of a spree buying up small, independent, innovative firms to scale them rather than going into the R&D and building something themselves. So, you know, I don't want you to give away the secrets, but just in that one, three, and five, what, what's the plan look like? Yeah, so I guess there's two things. One, in terms of a, a learning experience, is we've been so focused on our big picture plan. We want to be national distributors. We want to launch into Western Canada and then into Eastern Canada. We want to move uh, pallets. We want to work with distributors. We want to work with brokers. We want to have representation across our, you know, our beautiful country. Um, we're the big picture isn't always achievable right away. So what can you do with the tools you have to help you get to that big picture? So we've really kind of taken a few steps back and just, you know, we've pretty much, so we're building a small production facility, which is going to help us give that launch. We're building it here in Regina. We have an investor who's kind of essentially funding this for us and helping us build it. But, um, you know, we just assume, well, we can't get out of province in 2022. So what can we do? to meet our sales goals. And if we do get out of province, well, that's best case scenario kind of thing, but let's just assume we can't and really focus on what do we need to do to sustain our new operation. Obviously, we're gonna have more bills, we're gonna have more overhead to get us to the point where we could launch, uh, our goal is to launch Western Canada first, really get out into BC, really establish ourselves there, um, to partner with a competent broker and distributor who can help us achieve that. And then from there, we want to take over the Eastern markets. Um, our products, I mean, they speak for themselves when people try them, we cater to everyone. Like people are always surprised because our products are vegan and gluten free. The majority of people who buy our products are not vegan and they are not gluten free. They're just that way by nature, based on the ingredients we use. It's just a whole food product that happens to be healthy, but tastes delicious because we season it properly kind of thing. So, so yeah, we definitely do have a one, two, three, four year plan and we do want to be a national company. In terms of, you know, maybe selling our company, no, we'd say that now. No, we don't want to do that. But, I mean, if someone's throwing a bunch of money at us, and it's kind of, maybe, you know, who knows kind of thing. But, yeah, right now, no, we, I want to hold on to it. My business partner, he's a bit older than me. So I would see long-term me eventually buying him out. We have a small investor at some point buying him out. And then for me to launch this company into the States would be our next goal, maybe five years from now. It's really interesting because looking at your journey, and I've just been onto your website, it's, it's a very good, nice, clean uh, website, nice to navigate. It, it's very simple. It reminds me of um, uh, kind of the journey, slightly different, but kind of the journey that Johannes is on at Haynes Hummus and yeah. working on really focusing on a, a natural product that really speaks for itself, regardless of what, you know, people's interests are with their dietary uh, background. It's the product speaks first and making that step into you know, the, the distribution chains and the nationals and, and so on and so on. Um, comrade, I could talk all day about food. I'm a big food lover and I'm really interested about the business of food. Um, if people want to find out more information aside from just going to the website, which is back to you, back to you roots.com. Um, yeah. where can people find out more information about you? Because that's what I think people will be interested with. Yeah, so we um, we have our our business Facebook page, and we also and we're fairly active on there. And we have our we have our Instagram page as well. Um, back to your roots, all one word for Instagram, and then back to your roots YQR for uh, Facebook um, as well. And we do share a story. You know, we always say this is a, you know a lifestyle we're living in. These products that we produce help us feel our lifestyle in terms of you know health, movement, all that good stuff. So. Conrad, thank you so much for joining us here on Startupville. I'm going to put you straight into my contacts as Conrad the Marathon Man. Thank you so much for joining us here on Startupville. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it. 
Last but not least, we talked with Rob Henderson, President and CEO of BioTalent Canada a national nonprofit that supports the people behind life-changing science. Rob Henderson, President and CEO of BioTalent Canada, thank you so much for joining us here on Startupville. Thank you, my pleasure. So let's start from the very beginning. Um, Who and what is BioTalent Canada? (laughs) We're a really well-kept secret, I think. Uh, So BioTalent Canada, we are a national not-for-profit organization that Uh, supports the brain power behind Canada's biotech industry. So um, we uh, identify skills gaps uh, that occur across Canada within the biotech industry, and then we develop projects, products, and services to address them, to make sure that the biotech industry has access to the most skilled talent available. So does that mean talent that's already within Canada or is that international attraction? What shape does that take? Oh, international, absolutely, because uh, Canada's immigration policy um, is such that it, it allows the biotech industry uh, access to a very substantial font of talent through uh, newcomers. So absolutely, transferring those uh, the, the talent uh, and the skills of uh, educated newcomers is uh, very much at the heart of what we do as well. So there's always um, an opportunity for organizations to bring in the people that they want um, and that they need to really drive forwards their organization and their business. Um, But there's the question of settlement and acclimatization for people coming to a new country. This is something, as you can tell from my accent, the most, this (laughs) is the most rich Canadian accent I've got after seven years. there is a question of acclimatization for family members. What do you do as an organization to ensure that not only you're bringing over the right people, but they're able to support their family unit? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that we do that is fundamental to us is through our, our partnership. Uh, we have about 72 different corporate partners across Canada, some of which are Canada's largest immigrant, uh, immigrant, immigrant serving agencies. And uh, we find working through the immigrant service uh, service agencies and especially referring the biotech companies that are hiring these immigrants through them, that really bridges the gap because in, um, in the biotech industry in Canada, most of them are small and medium-sized enterprises. A lot of them don't have access or the expertise to the kind of support services that you're talking about to make sure that a, a newcomer placement uh, or a new hire really has success. Because to your point uh, exactly, Martin, is that sometimes the employment itself is quite successful. What fails or what is the real challenge is uh, the uh, acclimatizing the spouse or the family to the um to the uh, the area or to to the new uh, to the to society as it is where the where the biotech employment is occurring now this occurs a little bit easier in some of the major urban centers like you know Montreal Toronto Vancouver etc because there's such a a, a rich um, uh, environment of newcomers there, which help with that. But in other organizations, and particularly, I would say Saskatoon, um, and certainly in the in the Atlantic provinces, um, that can sometimes be a real challenge for some of these companies. So they really do need to have access to uh, the widest swath of support services around them to help them do that. So there's clearly a talent base out there, but something that really intrigues me in a conversation that I've had with people locally is with this requirement, this need for international talent to come here, what is the roadblocks? What are the issues about Canadian nationals, Canadian citizens not coming into this field? Why why are they not attracted to it? You mean why are, uh, I'm sorry, just to clarify the question, you mean why are Canadian citizens not attracted to hiring immigrants? No, why are Canadian citizens not interested, particularly on of of a of a reasonable number, to come into uh, biotech and biosciences? Oh, I, yeah, I think they are. Um, in fact, we have an unemployment problem with some of our young people who've gone through biosciences. In some provinces, that unemployment of some young people is up to twenty percent. Um, but to your point, um, um, I think there's a, there's a couple of issues. Biotech companies don't just need scientists. They also need those soft skills, though they're not really soft, but those business skills that are really, really, really um, uh, quite essential for them. So some of the kids that are graduating in colleges and universities are graduating a lot of the th- with a, a great deal of the theory of sciences. Uh, because our academic institutions are second to none in the world and instilling that kind of knowledge. But a lot of the times they don't, they fall short a little bit of uh, instilling some of the businesses, the business skills. So I think that's one of the problems is that uh, the biotech companies are looking for these unicorns 
<laughs> and they don't always have access to them. People who have that well-rounded business approach, but also have the science acumen. But back to your original question, Martin, um, are we doing a good enough job in getting kids and getting people in, in, interested in looking at the biotech industry? I would say not. I don't think we tell our story very particularly well. Um, so we are in an industry that is highly technical. It's highly process driven. Um, and um, we live in a society that wants to get to the point and tell the story very quickly, uh, almost an attention deficit disorder society in terms of messaging. Um, that doesn't mesh well with biotech. Our stories are very complex. Our science and our businesses are very complex. And we do a very poor job of trying to, to sell ourselves to other industries and people who haven't uh, joined our industry as potential employees. And I think we have to get better at that because it's going to be a much more competitive environment. Um, not only for immigrants, uh, as we just said, but also for the existing workforce that we've grown, we've homegrown domestically. So this really intrigues me. What are, what are some of the challenges, particularly in attracting and retaining bio talent? Oh, well, I think one of the biggest challenges is that just the nature of the businesses, most of over 80 percent of the businesses in biotech in Canada uh, are, are less than 50 people. And half of those, another so 25% of all of the companies out there are less than 10 people. So the problem is, is that the reason why we, we measure it almost like there's those companies that are over 50 or less than 50 is because that's usually the point where you have a dedicated expert resource for human resources. So in other words, you have someone who's got the expert in uh, attracting and retaining um, talent um, and developing policies and a culture that is conducive to that. So... The issue that we've got in biotech is we've got a lot of scientists that are grappling with the challenges of human resource management. Um, they've not been trained in it. They're ill-equipped to deal with it. And a lot of the times they avoid it because it's not something that they wanted to do. Um, so as a result, we've got a lot of cultures that are kind of clunky. They don't have necessarily the best policies in mind. Uh, they are not putting diversity and inclusion, for example, at the forefront like a lot of the other industries are now. And we know that diversity and inclusion, everything has shown that diversity and inclusion is, it's got to be a foundation principle um, of, of, of attracting and retaining talent. Not only does it give you uh, access to the widest variety and the deepest labor markets that are available to anyone in Canada, but all the statistics have shown that the, the, the companies that are diverse and inclusive, um, they're more innovative. Uh, they're, they make decisions quicker and better. Um, they're more productive. Uh, they're more strategic in their thinking just because, again, that, that whole diverse diversity, not just in appearance and in culture, but diversity in thought that it gives you. And again, biotech companies are they're late to the table and they're ill-equipped to be able to deal with that challenge. But that does mean, therefore, there are opportunities, which is which is good news. It's just getting getting the ducks in a row to be able to really harness that opportunity to really make that step forwards. Oh, I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think we need to tell some of the stories of the biotech companies who are embracing that challenge and who are really converting their own processes to show them as really uh, uh, employers of choice. We're we're in an interesting time since you know March 2020. The world has been a drastically different place, and with with COVID having hit the headlines for what feels like forever now. Um, there's clearly been an interest in health tech and pharma, and and that starts very much with public awareness of a problem and the pathways to the solutions and and making those moves forwards. But also, ag tech has been become a very exciting space uh, across the prairies, specifically in Saskatchewan. How do you believe that the prairies should capitalise on this? increased visibility of biotech and the capital to drive on the growth within the biotech industry here? Oh, I think ag tech has a, a massive challenge on its hands. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean in a good way. Um, but they're going to be competing with the other biotech subsectors, like, to your point, biohealth um, and pharmaceutical development, biomanufacturing, uh, which is uh, based on the federal government's plans, uh, going to have a resurgence. Um, when we start creating our own vaccines here uh, again, um, Ag uh, Agitech is going to have to compete with a, re um, a revitalized subsector in biohealth for talent. So I think uh, Agitech has a great um, opportunity on its hands. And I think the quicker that these small organizations up their game in things like um, aggressive and creative 
uh, recruitment um, tactics um, of diversity, embracing, not only embracing, celebrating diversity and inclusion, not adopting it because they have to or because they're forced to, but adopting, but adopting it, uh, de- developing it and championing it out as a real brand is going to be a very, very important part of ag tech. Um, they've got an opportunity in the fact that they can create from the, from the ground up um, a cluster uh, here, particularly in Saskatoon, that can attract from some of the larger urban centers where um, uh, perhaps the development or the job opportunities are not quite as, uh, as great. Um, so the, the, there's a real opportunity for them. The, re- uh, the other uh, challenge that's going to be in, in, in communities like Saskatoon and has been, has not always been recruiting talent, it's been retaining talent. So that means they have to really get their own internal house in order in terms of total compensation in terms of creative and progressive professional development and retention policies to make sure that they're not only going to attract the right people, but they're going to be able to keep them. Rob, I'm fascinated by your um, enthusiasm for this and the energy that you put into this. It's clearly a sector that you believe in. You believe in the opportunities that come from it as well and the people in real lives that it impacts. What motivates you as you know, as Rob Henderson to really, you know, get out of bed each morning, grab that coffee and take that step forward. Well, beyond beyond my love of science and my 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 own biology background and a passion for science, mine's very simple to describe. So um, this year uh, marks the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin by the parent of Canadian biotechnology, Dr. Frederick Banting. In fact, they're going to be celebrating this in this November, uh, this in November in two months, two months time. And the reason why I'm tremendously motivated is is very simple. My younger son, Cameron, has type 1 diabetes. So I'm fortunate enough to work for an industry that saves his life every day. That is why. And you know what? When you see someone who glows because of a reason that 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 uh, motivating factor you can feel it it's palpable and that's what excites me about a lot of people who work in the biotech industry because i see this because there's often a motivator as to why they have got involved in this sector full stop um i just want to before before time beats us because time is uh, is no friend of mine with the <laughs> amount that i speak um but before time beats us i really want to look back at this at this space at this opportunity and i think you've really landed on something where there's a there's an opportunity a gap whether it's for for um people of different provinces or people fresh out of of university this business acumen element that also comes into um a part of an education where do you think which organizations could come together to really address this gap where um you know there is this clear opportunity for nationals to be going into this sector, but they're missing something that our international fellows and friends have got? I think um, the academic institutions are going to be incredibly challenged because, and they should be, uh, because it is no longer adequate, even in an org- even in an industry like biotech, which has one of the most, the highest education, average education levels of any vertical in the world. Um, it's not going to be enough for uh, provinces or regions colleges and universities to get their people educated. Uh, That's not going to be enough. It's going to be getting them a job or getting them job ready. And I think the academic institutions have a great opportunity here, not only with the domestic population that they're educating already, but also with newcomers to expand their offerings and to use the technology like what we're doing right here, virtual knowledge, virtual education, virtual, uh, virtual training opportunities to get people job ready to work in Canada's bioeconomy. You know, what, some of the jobs that uh, our labor market inst- research has indicated that some of the jobs, uh, the skills deficits that exist in the biotech are not just around research and R&D positions. There are marketing, sales, uh, executive leadership, finance, HR. And these are skills that are present in abundance in other industries. Do you really have to have a PhD in molecular biology to run the HR department of a, of a biotech company or to market it? I think that's debatable. And I think some of our standards are going to have to uh, be re-examined in that light. And the biotech companies are going to have to educate or, excuse me, find people from other industries and educate them with enough science that they can perform their function adequately for that company. 
because I think us looking for uh, incredible salespeople and marketing people with PhDs is going to be very, very difficult. And if we don't start broadening not only our tactics and getting training companies and academic institutions to raise their game, I think we're, we have a real, real threat that the bioeconomy will stall. Rob Henderson, a fascinating conversation. Time is working against us. But before you leave, I want people to have the opportunity to understand more about Biotalent Canada. Where could they go? Sure. Best place is our website, biotalent.ca. And you can find us also on LinkedIn. We're very prevalent on that and around the jobs, jobs and skills that are around. And you can find us on Facebook and Twitter as well. This episode is brought to you by Martin Charlton Communications at wetellyourstories.ca, AgWest Bio, Biotalent Canada, and Innovation Place. The show is produced by me, Mike Wolsfeld, Ariel Delorier, and our host, Dan Gold. Our theme music is from GG Riggs and Reactor Production. Learn more about us and our guests at innovationplace.com slash startupville. And follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Startupville Pod. See you next time on Startupville.